So what do you get when you cross Michael Crichton, a rock musician, a Christian apologist, and a magician? You got Doug Powell. And on today's podcast, we're going to be talking to Doug Powell and his two latest novels. These are archaeological thrillers. We're going to dive into some really, really fascinating stuff today, guys. We're going to talk about the Shroud of Turin. We're going to talk about the Well of the Souls and the possible location of the Ark of the Covenant. And we're going to get into some really, really cool stuff today. So I hope you'll join us today as we talk with Doug Powell. Oh, uh, well, thanks for having me. Although all my magician friends are groaning over the magician part because they know how <laughs> terrible I am. <laughs> no. Doug, Doug and I have known each other for several years and, uh, and I'm really excited to have him. And Doug, I'm gonna, if that's okay, I'm going to read your, your bio that you sent and okay. um, it's really great. And you have a website. If people want to find you, they can go to DougPowell.com or is that .org? It's .com dot com dougpowell.com yeah. we'll have it right there on the screen so you can see it but doug powell is the best-selling author of more than a dozen books on christian apologetics he's a speaker a musician a songwriter a graphic designer and a very amateur musician or a magician rather his latest project is the graham elliott series of a biblical archaeology thrillers which is a combination of apologetics church history and archaeology wrapped in mystery it's really really cool guys you're going to want to get these books among the Ashes follows last year's The Well of the Soul as the last, as the, excuse me, the second in the series. He has performed on Late Night with Conan O'Brien and has been featured on CNN and NPR. He also uh, appears on the latest two Alan Parsons albums as a performer on four songs that he co-wrote with Parsons. And Doug lives currently lives outside Nashville, Tennessee. And so, uh, Doug, thanks again for coming on the program today. Uh, thanks for having me. Really, really excited to, to have you to, to discuss these really cool stuff. And we were talking earlier and, and uh, man, we, we get to talk and it just, just goes on and on. There's some <laughs> stuff to talk about. Um, but many people may not know who you are. And I guess I read that your bio there, but um, you have some really cool history. You are a musician. And were you always into music growing up or did you uh, sort of come into it later in life? Or how did you get how do you professionally get into music? Uh, I was always interested in music. That was the consuming passion all growing up and early adulthood. My mom is a professional musician. Uh, she's a concert flautist. And so it was always just part of the, the furniture of my house, except that instead of concert flautist, I, I substituted <laughs> like Kiss and <laughs> yes. uh, stuff like that, which didn't go over really well at first. But uh, uh, so it's just always been a part of who I am, but it's never been all of who I am. Uh, I, I do a lot of things, but uh, that's what I pursued uh, relentlessly uh, early on and was able to get a record deal and make a living uh, out of it for a few years. Um, and then, uh, it, you know, when the opportunity stopped, I had other things to go do. And so I went and did them and tried not to do music. And I, it's like Al Pacino in The Godfather. You just you try to get out and you get sucked back in. And exactly. so that's why the like the Alan Parsons stuff keeps happening. Um, and it's not like Alan Parsons is calling me up going, hey, man, I, will you, you know, give me some songs. It, I have uh, one of my old bandmates plays with them, and that has just turned into an opportunity to, to work with them. So uh, it's something I do uh, occasionally, and then I just kind of put it away and go back to doing other things. That's cool. And you were telling me, uh, I had heard this story a while back, but uh, you were asked, uh, people think this is really, I think people would think this is pretty cool. You were asked to be the lead singer for the band Cars. That didn't really turn out, but you were asked though, correct? Uh, I was asked there was a, there was a plan to, to get back together with out Rick. And at that point, Ben had died. And uh, so originally they were thinking about doing something kind of like journey did where they yeah. uh, got somebody who was not a known entity and they would just kind of pick up where they left off and they, they changed focus before any of that could happen. But it was, uh, it was nice 
thinking about it because they were one of my favorite bands growing up. So. Oh, yeah. Great, great. So many great tunes for that band. Yeah. And uh, do you now living in Nashville uh, that, of course, people think Nashville is like, you know, country music and it, it is. But there's so many other genres of music and recording the recording industry, really. Yeah, there's a lot of people here that you wouldn't think would be here. Mm -hmm. uh, the secret's kind of getting out. But back yeah. in the day, it used to be kind of uh, you just never knew uh, who you were going to see around town. And uh, I mean, none of the cars live here or anything like that. And Alan Parsons doesn't live here. So that's not how any of that happens. <laughs> but there are enough of uh, people who live in Nashville because they they want the music business, but they don't want L.A. or New York that yep. uh, you, you can get surprised by yeah, who it, you see around. It makes sense. My mother actually lives about uh, just about an hour and 50 minutes south of Nashville in North Alabama. Mm -hmm. And several years ago, um, I, I stayed with her for a little, little while. And um, I drove up to uh, uh, up the Natchez Trace Parkway, which I don't know if you know where that is, but sure. we drove. I drove up to uh, Leper's Fork and uh, and then I was walking in Puckett's grocery store. So anybody in Nashville knows Puckett's. It's mm -hmm. like a lot of musicians would go there. It was a Wednesday and I'm sitting there and I thought, well, I'll just, you know, before I head back south, I'm going to just grab a burger real quick. And I'm sitting in there. It's like hardly like four people in the whole thing. And I look into the doorway and the guy walking in the door, he's got like dreadlocks. He's got tats all down his arm, like sleeve. It's Brian Head Welch of the corn. <laughs> <laughs> so Hilarious. He, out in so Leaper's Fork. At Labor's, Labor's Fork, exactly, and and uh, he was. So I, I went and talked to him. He was really laid back and really cool. And yeah, th I think the movie that he had just made with his daughter, uh, Love Loud, or something like that. He was in Nashville. Uh, I think the premiere of that it was several years ago. Huh. But uh, super, super nice guy. Really laid back. Oh, so that's hilarious. So Doug, did you grow up in Nashville? Where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in Stillwater, Oklahoma, which is where gotcha. Oklahoma State University is, and both my parents were professors there. Oh, very cool. What do they teach? Uh, my dad's a physicist, and my mom was uh, in the music department. Awesome. Uh, she, 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 like I said, she was a concert flautist. Gotcha. Now, did you grow up as a believer, or did, did you, how did you, I guess what, I'm, what I really want to drill into, and we're going to sort of transition now into archaeology and apologetics, but um, were you always in a, what brought you to apologetics? And I guess before that, you know, really what's your kind of walk, your, your Christian faith? Uh, what's the story uh, there? I grew up in the Episcopal church in mm -hmm. Stillwater, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can't say that I was a believer. I went through confirmation and, you know, you do all the check the box type of thing to receive communion and that sort of thing. But uh, it was never something I believed in uh, until the summer before my senior year in high school, I had a kind of a Damascus Road type of experience and that radically reoriented my life. And I, and I became a believer at that point. Um, but I don't really tell a lot of the details of that story because uh, it, it's like Paul's conversion in the sense that whenever he is trying to give a reason for why other people should believe he doesn't point to that because his experience shouldn't be the basis of someone else's faith if yeah. what he believes is true about the world that we all share uh experience in, then he should be able to appeal to something other than his experience there should be evidence to defend uh what he believes as worldview and that was something that was not clear to me for a long time. And so discovering apologetics built that bridge, uh, gave me a way to be able to, to articulate my faith in a way that made sense to other people. And uh, that was, I mean, once I just, you know, I, I knew about C.S. Lewis. I thought he was kind of like a man from Mars, that there wasn't like a ton of people like that. Yeah. And then when I discovered that there, there was a rich history of that and there were there really were answers out there that you could kick the tires of, of Christianity as hard as you wanted to. You could test the faith and you can investigate it. Uh, I, I, it was just, that was just something that I, it was inexhaustible. That was all I did was dive into that stuff and uh, grew so passionate about it. I, then I discovered you could get a, a degree in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I was already doing that, uh, you know, doing all the work. So I might as well get the credit so that I ended up going uh, to Biola and getting a master's uh, in apologetics. That's awesome. Now, um, when you began to get into apologetics, were you reading um, 
uh, what kind of books you like William Lane Craig and and stuff like that. Maybe Norm Geisler, maybe some Biola guys. Um, uh, it like the way I ended up over at Biola was because I j organically fell into the or uh, the, the Biola guys, uh, yeah. crowd there. So, uh, and then it, it spread from there, but that was the initial core, you know, JP Moreland and William Lane Craig. And mm -hmm. that's how I discovered Habermas. Uh, yep. I believe, um, I probably initially heard of a lot of those guys through Greg Kokel. Um, awesome. and his ministry stand to reason, which, you know, I yeah. think he's the best short answer guy out there. Agree. Uh, and, yeah. uh, he articulates things so well that I find myself adopting the way he articulates them, yep. which is embarrassing if I'm ever around him. Cause I just repeat his own thoughts <laughs> back to him and claim him as my own and then feel like an idiot. So. He's great. And, and the, and the tactics book is just fantastic. It's, it's so yeah. great. Yeah, so great. So, so uh, when you were at Biola, you were uh, exposed to, uh, I guess, archaeology, biblical archaeology, and uh, some of these evidences, some of these historical um, archaeological evidences for the scripture. Uh, was that something that uh, initially, I mean, did you become interested in archaeology when you were, uh, begin to study apologetics? What, what, uh, what was the connection there? There was always an interest in the uh, archaeological aspect, but there are so many uh, bad sources out there. It was yeah. one of those just not knowing where to start because sometimes, you know, I'd pick up a book and then I'd get this. It became apparent yeah. that, th that this is more like pseudo archaeology uh, and bad argumentation there. You know, there's a lot of exploitative things out Very there. Much. And uh, and what I needed was a guide through them, uh, a yeah. good place to start. And so I was always fascinated, uh, but it was always cautious at the same time. Yeah. And although I, I am not an archaeologist and I don't have any formal training in that, the archaeological uh, training I do have comes from the, the scientific apologetics classes I took as part of the apologetics program at Biola. So it's more like being folded into a general scientific uh, a survey, uh, you know, of the arguments. Uh, however, uh, it gave me a good start point to dig deeper. And uh, we were talking earlier, you and I have seen each other at uh, the uh, ETS conferences. And part of that is the annual meeting of the Near East Archaeological yep. Society. And that's where you get to hear the latest reports and, you know, interact with peers and present the ideas and hear the, the latest evidence and stuff like that. And I end up sitting next to my professor from Biola almost every time <laughs> and uh, compare notes and stuff. And uh, uh, so, you know, it was, it was a passion of his as well, but it gave me uh, a good place to start and uh, dig deeper and how to recognize the bad stuff. That's awesome. We're going to get into some, some, some of the really interesting things that you talk about that you, uh, in your own ministry and, and, you know, what you do and, um, but we'll do that in a second, but what fascinates me about your approach, Doug, and what I love about it, what I think is so awesome about it is that you use creativity and imagination to bridge the world of archaeology and apologetics and the average everyday person. And what, what's so really cool about that, and I, and I guess you already knew this, but, but archaeology and literature goes all the way back to like Agatha Christie and before, you know, Agatha Christie was a great novelist and her husband, she was actually uh, married to Max Malawan, who was, uh, who was an archaeologist and they would travel on the Orient Express out of Istanbul. And of course, she wrote Murder on the Orient Express and uh, she's been on some of these excavations. Um, I think it's really cool. And what, and so your latest novels that you uh, have written and that you're continuing to write more, you have more coming out in the series, um, is the series of a, this archaeo this fictional archaeologist, Graham Elliott, who sort of like an Indiana Jones, would you say he's like an Indiana Jones figure or is that too, too and That's easy? probably too, a little, little too Hollywood. What he is, is like, uh, uh, well, I mean, flat out, he's based on m most of him is based on Daniel Wallace. Oh, uh, cool. That is his job in the books is, uh, you know, Daniel Wallace goes around uh, the world in the, with this project to uh, scan, uh, digitally scan at very high quality, all of the 
uh, extant original Greek manuscripts and uh, so that the scholars have access to them without having to travel. And he ends up going into some crazy places and having some amazing experiences. And uh, so I asked him permission to steal his life. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he gave it to me. So, That's awesome. But uh, actually, ten percent of uh, of the profits of the of the novels, if you buy them through the publisher's website, actually go to the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts, which is that foundation. And that, we'll have that on the screen, uh, guys, so you'll see okay. it. Yep. Go ahead. So, but no, that's that's it. So, but so yeah. yeah, so the ten percent of the of the of the sales go to that to the Center for New Testament Manuscripts, right? Yeah, that's right, that's right. So, and you know, D Daniel Wallace doesn't exactly look like Harrison Ford. So there's there's somewhere in between. He's got better stories than Harrison it's, Ford, uh, right? Uh, Harrison yes, he does. Ford wishes he was Daniel Wallace. Yes, uh, but uh, uh, yeah. So that that's that, who it's really based on. That is so awesome, and uh, I'm so glad you that that you mentioned him because uh, and and were we there at the same? We were uh, we were in I was in Texas with Frank Turek uh, years ago when um, they were uh, you know looking at some of the some of the manuscripts, and Daniel Wallace was there, and uh, Josh McDowell was there, and many other. I think Nabil Karishi was there. Were you at that meeting in Texas when they did the reveal for some of those? Uh, there were two of those meetings. I okay. was at the second one of those. Okay. I don't remember seeing you at the one that I was at. Okay. Neil so, was at both of them, I know. Okay. So, yeah, Greg Hochul was at this one. Uh, myself, Frank Turek. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure um, Clay Jones, I think, was there. Um, uh -huh. A lot of Biola guys were there. Clay was at the second one. Hazen second. was at the second one. Daniel Craig Wallace Hazen. was at the second one. That's right, yeah. So, so Dr. Wallace um, is a New Testament scholar who is actually recording, um, going around in these monasteries and these libraries around the world, and digitally, he's a real guy, a real scholar, and uh, he's got many published works, and they are actually digitally, high definition, digitally archiving these manuscripts that are found around the world, and, and uh, so we didn't get into it, but let me go back and just kind of start from the beginning with your novels and uh doug give us give the listeners a little bit of a like okay so what are the titles so far that you've written uh the I first happen one to have them right here hey. actually all uh, right so the first one is the well of the soul and this was at this uh the, this the the first scene of this is now i'd never written a novel in my life. Okay. I'm a massive fiction reader. I love novels. I thought it would always be super cool to write a novel, but I didn't know how to do that. I didn't ever sit around writing fiction or anything. I wrote, I wrote songs. Um, I'm used to compacting things and symbolizing things, not like, uh, you know, expanding on them. So the idea of a novel, I just couldn't wrap my head around it, but uh, at the second of those events you were talking about, um, the uh the 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 main day there turned into the first scene of the novel and in fact so you've got uh uh well here scott carroll was there that day yes okay and scott carroll is the guy who ended up being one of the primary guys to collect the uh, uh what became the museum of the bible he was working for the green family for like 10 years and yes. one of the things he had done was a uh, developed um, a kind of a proprietary method for dissolving the structure of a uh, papyri mummy mask in order to recover the pieces of papyri that you know the the, the a lot of the cheaper mummy masks uh, or mummy masks made for less important figures were made out of cartonnage, which is is kind of a paper mache made with papyri. Yes, and so you'd use discarded papyri to do that. And so the idea is if you get the right piece of cartonnage uh, from about the right time period and the right from the right part of the world, you may find discarded pieces in the New Test copies of the New Testament in there. That was a theory. And so he had two mummy masks that day. It was hosted by Josh McDowell. And uh, so we had two mummy masks that day. This is one of them. I took the picture on the cover of that. Very and cool. um, and then uh, he 
put on this microphone headset and he had an industrial sink and there was a big camera that, you know, an overhead camera. And he narrated what he did as he submerged it in the I remember that solution. And, yeah. you know, you just see it disappear onto these bubbles and you're thinking, oh, my gosh, what, <laughs> what in the world does he think he's doing? He's destroying this, you know, valuable piece of yeah. cultural property here. He had, he'd put spray fix on the front of it to try to retain the shape, at least keep the 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 outer the face part of it as he peeled away at least some of the layers behind it it worked on one of them not on the other but mm -hmm. he was able to he would like he would pull off uh he, out, of, out of the solution he would pull a, a a little fragment out and he'd say well let's see that's like greek characters but it's written in uh in in egyptian looks you know looks like uh, coptic text maybe fourth century or so you know you kind of ballpark it mm -hmm. and he set him aside and he did that uh and pulled as many as he could and uh and then we all went to lunch while they dried and then when we came back everybody tried to identify what had been extracted and uh, which was great because there were a bunch of tables set up and everybody there was a there was a workstation in each one that had it was open to an ancient manuscript database. And so you would enter in all the words that you could read in the order that you could read them. Mm -hmm. And they acted as keywords for hits of known ancient manuscripts. Yep. And uh, so uh, I was able to contribute um, one thing, and, and that is I did read the word and i was the first person <laughs> to read the word and in like almost two thousand years hey uh, other than that i was completely uh worthless uh other than totally geeking out and i thought what is the coolest thing you could possibly i mean this is super cool what's going on yes and i thought well, what's the what is the most outrageous thing he could plausibly pull out of there and I wasn't trying to come up with the idea of a novel, but about two years later, three years later, all of a sudden I have this, oh, that's what he could pull out of there. And all of a sudden I had the first scene of a novel and it just, it just, it was like a seed. It just, all of a sudden, all the ideas fell into place. Awesome. And that's how this, that the book came to be. So the, the, the book ended up being, there are so many fascinating stories in biblical archeology. span There's so much rich history there that, is better than any movie you've ever seen. Yeah, absolutely. But but if you don't read these books on archaeology or the history of archaeology, you wouldn't know that. And a lot of times the facts are all there, but it's it's like they're amazing, but it's not a very engaging read. And so I thought, well, just string a bunch of these crazy things together, come up with a story that strings <laughs> these real things together. Yeah. And then uh, it would be a great way to uh, to introduce people to a lot of the important uh, and interesting finds in biblical archaeology that all tie into church history. They uh, uh, also act uh, in an apologetic way, providing uh, evidence and assurance for believing that the New Testament has real history or the Old Testament that the Bible in general has has real history in there. And, uh, and then it serves, I mean, uh, it was just a fun project to come up with, but sounds awesome. Um, one of the things that I struggled with, um, when I first was studying at Biola is that when I discovered that there are these guys, these apologists who were able to articulate, you know, defenses of the faith, I admired them so much. I just thought, well, that's how you do it. You, you, you work to become a William Lane Craig or a Gary Habermas or a J.P. Moreland or somebody like that. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's lots to admire there. But I figured out pretty quickly I wasn't one of those guys because I kept having these kind of like other other ideas of how to work it out. And, you know, I come from a creative background. I'm a graphic designer. I, you know, have been a musician and songwriter and, and I express myself creatively and, and they don't do that, which is not a criticism of them. No. It's just something they don't do. And so I, to limit myself to do what they do, first of all, I can't do it. I'm not built that way. I, mm -hmm. I keep getting, you know, uh, coming up with ways of doing apologetics that, that really haven't been done before uh or are you know kind of unique and so this was another one of those i have this idea for a novel that conveyed all of that stuff and it seemed like a good idea because there's not a lot of crossover mm. between people who are in a, into apologetics and 
Christians I know who read fiction um, right. or uh, or anybody who reads fiction, right? There's not people who are reading both. I read both, but that's that's not very common. So the people who uh, uh, are uh, reading apologetics all the time, they're not, you know, yeah. they read, they get this stuff anyway. They're not, right. you know, this, it's kind of a novel idea for them uh, yeah. that it's done this way. But for people who want these answers, and who, when when they get a book that isn't, you know, an apologetics book or whatever, or, uh, you know, a systematic theology or whatever, and they have all the answers to the questions that they have, and they start reading it, they just glaze over, you know, it, it's yes. just, it's, it, do, it, it doesn't appeal to them how it, the way that it's written mm -hmm. doesn't allow them to uh, apprehend that content. You know, they, it, it, it gets lost on them. It's so dry. And so this is a way of conveying a lot of that same information with this spoonful of sugar, which is this biblical archaeology thriller type of I, adventure. I love it for many, many reasons. And it reminds me of, uh, of, uh, of uh, a C.S. Lewis quote of, about the watchful dragons and about how people, you know, um, people sort of, if, if you have an apologist like a, a William Lane Craig or someone else, you know what they're going to say. But if, you, if it's in a novel, if it's in a story form, then it sneaks behind those sort of watchful dragons that sort of like, I'm not going to listen to what you say. So that's actually a really, really brilliant way to do that. It's really uh, contextualizing it and fleshing the truth in a in a really, really cool format, and uh, and then it's in a story format. And that's really, I think, one of the best avenues to to do apologetics is in the in the form of a story, and, and not just any story, but in the story of archaeology and some of these amazing discoveries. So you have Graham Elliot. Let's come back to Graham Elliot, and this is in the Well of the Souls. He discovers this manuscript can you give us any teasers as to where the story is going to go kind of where it, the direction is going to head what's he going to uh, find is he going to find any what's he going to look what's he going to look for or find well uh it, th there have been a number of novels that are based on the idea of the of following the copper scroll okay the copper yes. scroll was the uh, treasure map found among the dead sea scrolls it's really more of an uh a list of hiding places uh, more than a treasure map. It's not right. like, you know, you follow the, they're, they're markers certainly. And then a list of, of, and then what's going to be at that place. Mm -hmm. Some of these are kind of known places, uh, some, uh, but a lot of them, there's no way you could, you know, uh, you could ever trace them down. It'd be like between the two tamarisk trees under <laughs> the stone, you know, and you have like no idea. There's no way you could recover what that was. But the, the idea that there was a treasure map found at the Dead Sea Scrolls is, has fascinated a number of people. And there have been several novels written about that. Mm -hmm. What, uh, so I didn't quite go there. I put a little spin on it and uh, in the mummy mask. So it starts off with this conference guys doing the mummy mask thing. He's pulling off little strips and he pulls out, <clears throat> excuse me a um a strip that uh has almost the same text as the copper scroll Ooh. and the theory is that it is the last item on the copper scroll the last item on the copper scroll actually does reference a hiding place that has another scroll that has all the items in more detail and that's wow. never been discovered and so this would have been like a draft of the copper scroll but it, it, a draft of whatever that scroll is so it fills in some of the blanks so now they've got a little bit more to work on problem is you can only read like four of the locations because of the size of the fragment and one of the locations is clearly not any place that you could investigate at this point so now you're down to three and uh but uh so this guy's got to go to these three places but because of there's there's certain events he has to do it secretly and uh there is there's danger involved in how he does it so he ends up going to jerusalem having to do these uh uh go to these sites in a hurry but one of them happens to be uh in cistern eight under the temple mount and oh, the, wow. the one of the things that the uh, people find fascinating is that the temple mount uh it just looks like this gigantic platform and you never really think about what's under it but there are about 35 36 cisterns 
uh, underneath it. There had to be an enormous waterworks system in order to wash away the blood sacrifices, in order to provide water for the pilgrims visiting, uh, you know, because there's not in, in, a, a robust water supply in ancient Jerusalem. You got the Gihon Spring and that's it. That's so right. you got to catch the water. And this is before the aqueduct uh, brought the water to the temple. And so you had to, you had to catch it. And, and so there are these enormous uh, cisterns built into the temple platform. And if you go up there uh, to this day, you'll still see these little, almost like golf, like it's like the hole that you, that you hit uh, your golf ball at. It's yes. just in there and they're rain catchers. And then there are these well caps uh, on the temple mount to this day. And there are these green uh, steel coated uh, lids that are padlocked on them. And, and, and nobody has been allowed in there to investigate them since about the 1860s and it happened with two different guys charles wilson and charles warren yep. and they were each allowed about a day to do a survey of everything that they could find and they had to do it without electric light so a lot of times they're hanging from ropes with a candle in one hand trying to draw whatever they can see in the other and some of these cisterns are so big you can't even see all the way across them and so the their survey map of what's beneath the temple map is the best survey map we have to this day and some of that's just ballpark. Nobody's ever been able to explore it. And one of the fascinating things is that in the cisterns, there are conduits. And we don't know exactly how the conduits all connect together. And uh, so one of the hiding places turns out to be in Cistern 8, which has three different well caps right in front of the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the third holiest spot in Islam. Mm -hmm. So they got to figure out a way to get under there without starting world war three <laughs> and see what's there, you know? So that's kind of the trajectory of it. <laughs>